today we're going to be going over what is group investing so you'll understand what group investing is the dip the different forms of group investing the pros and cons of group investing and the avenues of raising money for group investing and then we're going to talk about action steps the biggest thing i i, I want to put out there to y'all is to take some action a lot of people go to seminars webinars events and learn a lot of great information none of which will help you unless you take some specific action steps so i like to end up my presentations with those specific action steps in hopes that you will take them and use them and and be profitable okay now what exactly is group investing essentially it's when two or more investors get together to acquire property two or more that's it they effectively are a group that owns the property the structure however can take many different forms i want to reemphasize this because i get this question a lot from people about syndications or group investing and it seems like this this mystery world and it seems like this this thing that just is, involves hundreds of investors and people think that they have to form a REIT real estate investment trust in order to make it happen which is not the case if you and a and a, and a buddy a friend a cousin decide to go buy a property you're effectively a group and it's that same principle you can take from you and one other person and apply that to something in the big leagues all right so i want to start with that very very important now, there's different forms, however, of how you can be structured as a group and how you can operate. And the form of the group investment, the form of the syndication is going to depend on what you're doing, how you're doing it, the people you're involved with, where you are in the country, what your objectives are. Very important. Now, I'm going to go through this, but I want, I want to stop for a second because I think whether you're investing as yourself or you're investing with a team, that you have to have a very clear cut investment criteria. And you also have to have a very clear cut, cut investment plan, right? And your investment criteria is baked in or built in to your investment plan. And what I mean by that is you have a written plan of attack of how you're gonna go about investing. That's your investment plan. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, you know all the businesses we have a business plan now, everybody some people have an elaborate 20 page you know harvard business school business plan some people have a one or two pager and i think the one or two pager is actually more functional but you got to have some kind of plan of how you're going to run your business you need to look at investing and specifically investing in a real estate as a business all right because it's different than hey you just give put up some money and buy some stocks or hey you just put up some money buy some precious metals you are effectively running a business so therefore you need a plan of action so we call it an investment plan because you're investing you're in the business of investing right you need to have that and you say what are you doing all this in real estate investing for what is the end goal right and, and look that's probably the biggest thing you need to consider is what is your end goal now it seems simple I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in like the last two to three months, particularly, who are maybe looking at retirement or looking at, hey, we've we've made it to the mountaintop, what's next type of thing. Now, having clearly defined that up front will help make will help you to make decisions and every move that you make and every decision that you make should coincide with that end goal. So when you get there, you're just executing. You're not thinking about, hey, well, what am I doing? What am I thinking about? What do I want to do? You know it, and you can think clearer. You can think faster. You can think on your feet. You need to start with that. Now, that's if it's, you're just doing you by yourself. Once you take on investors, once you invest with a team, right? Because some of you may take on investors. Some of you may invest with a team. I've done both. Probably will continue to do both. We'll definitely continue to do both, right? What is very, very important when you do this, is that you've got a detailed plan of action and what this particular next deal, what is that gonna do for you in the long run and how does that correlate with your plan? Now, your plan needs to have a very clear cut investment 
criteria. In other words, we're going to buy apartment buildings, or we're going to buy retail shopping centers, or we're going to buy single family homes, or we're going to buy industrial, you know, uh, properties, we're going to buy office parks, whatever it is, or you may be like us, we're going to buy multifamily properties and, and small to mid sized commercial real estate that coincides with multifamily that's around multifamily that services multifamily. That's our cry, clear cut criteria. Then you need to say, well, what, you know, what rate of return are we looking at? And there's different levels of rates of return. There's, there's the cap rate, there's the cash on cash, there's the internal rate of return, all right? And there's return on equity. You need to think of, through all of that up front, especially when either you are putting together a group or you are investing into a group. Either way, because the move you make needs to coincide with your plan. And then if you're going to invest into that group, you need to make sure that your goals and plans, your criteria is in line with the group that you're investing's criteria. Very, very important. If you don't got that up front, when you get in, when you get time to make some decisions, you're going to kind of be shooting from the hip. Now, some of y'all may be seasoned veterans who shoot from the hip and you got you know, you can hit a bullseye, bullseye from 100 yards away. More power to you. I would still say having that detailed plan and having that investment criteria will help you. If you are the sponsor, if you are the person putting this stuff together, if you are out there raising capital, you absolutely have to have that. Because now it's not just you and your money and your risk. It's other people's money. And you have to handle that with diligent care. All right. And, and having that plan having that criteria will then help you to figure out the structure of how you're going to go and invest in a group. All right. Here's some of those structures, joint tenancy or joint venture. In other words, not the best way to do it at all. Joint tenancy is not joint venturing typically is done via joint tenancy, but it can be done in different ways. And the reason why it's not, not typically the best is because if somebody dies, their interest goes to the other partner, not to their family. That usually is, creates a fight, right? So not really the best way to do it. However, it is done all the time. Tenants in common. Now, the tenants in common is a great way to own real estate to where people can 1031 exchange in and out of that. However, it's not as popular as it used to be. In the Great Recession, uh, a lot of tenant before the Great Recession, a lot of properties were acquired via tenants in common. And there's kind of different tenants in common. There's the big investment structure tenants in common where a company is sponsor goes out and finds a big apartment building 200 300 units or a big hotel a marriott somewhere and then they bring in smaller tenants in common who roll in usually from their 1031 exchanges and are investors then there was the tenant in common structure that was really popular in san francisco where this was an alternative to condo conversions as you know condo conversions were very, very popular in the early to mid 2000s, but also very difficult to execute, particularly on smaller buildings. So a remedy for that was each person can buy their unit in a building and they would be a tenant in common. They would own 25% of the building, if you will, if it's a fourplex, they would have rights to their space, there would be a TIC agreement. Very, pretty much the same thing, but different in a lot of different ways. That, as the Great Recession, played out, there was a lot of complications within the TIC structure and tenants and, and TIC agreements and all of that. And so now what's kind of taken the place of TICs are DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trusts. And those are a, a lot more common for the big syndicators, the big sponsors who are putting together these groups and buying properties. That's more common. It, it still gives you what's called a deeded interest. And that was the benefit of tenants in common is that you roll into a property and you get what's called a deeded interest into the property. You don't only have 25% of the LLC, you've got 25% of the LLC and you've got 25% of the deed. Very, very important because that then qualifies your 1031 exchange. If you only have a certain percentage of the LLC, that's not going to qualify if you're doing an exchange because you, you do not have a deeded interest. In the DST structure, very similar to tenants and commons, you do have that deeded interest so you can exchange into it. Very, very popular, very common. Uh, just TICs got a bad, it just was a bad, not I'm going to say bad rap, but there's a lot of legal things to untangle 
And so the Delaware Statutory Trust seems to be the way to go these days. Now, general and limited partnerships. General partnerships, you don't want to own real estate in a general partnership because both, prop both partners have full liability for everything. What you should rather do if you're going to do a partnership is a limited partnership where the investor's only liability is to the money they invest. The sponsor is the general partner and will take on more of the risk and you know operate the property and the project. But the investors have a limited, that's why it's called a limited partnership, they have a limited liability, which you want to limit your your liability as much as possible. There's risks when we invest in anything, but particularly when we invest in real estate. Why is that? Because essentially, like I said before, this is a business. It's an active living, breathing thing that you're investing in and there's liabilities. You got to cover yourself, All right? And the next one, LLC, is, is really what has been the most popular since the mid 2000s to now of owning real estate or owning businesses. LLCs have become the popular way to structure your ownership because you get the limited liability like you do in limited partnerships, but you get a little bit better flow through of how everyone receives their profits, their cash flows, their tax, either liabilities or benefits, uh, all of those things. So limited liability companies are really more in vogue these days in terms of owning properties as a group. Now, real estate investment trust REITs, these are for the big deals. Really, typically, you got to have like a, a hundred investors to be a REIT. Uh, you know, this is more of a corporate structure. You will see uh, companies that are publicly traded in the stock market that own big commercial real estate. These are typically REITs, like Avalon Bay. Avalon Bay is a luxury apartment owner. They own luxury apartments all over the U.S. Um, their stock price is actually doing pretty good uh, right now, considering. And I think, the, and, and a company like them actually is is poised to do well in times of inflation because they they typically own properties that are you know not restricted by rent control and are in higher end areas, and so it's easier for them to raise rents, right? In, in rent control areas, very difficult to raise rents, and then in, in a let's say inflationary time like we are in now where you may not be able to raise your rents, but your utility bills are going up, your maintenance costs are going up, everything's going up, that can be tough, right? So just, just you're probably not going to put together a REIT unless you have big uh, ambitions and you aspire to take over the world and go out there and be public and stuff like that. There are privately traded REITs, but those are for the bigger, huger deals out there, right? Just, I wanted to talk to you about them. Also, community land trusts. Community land trusts are a great way for governments and nonprofits and people who are invested into the community to own uh, properties publicly and private, privately together. It's a great way for public-private partnerships. And it's a great way to maintain properties for a particular purpose in a particular area. Not the most advantageous way if you're just looking for pure profits in business, right? The, the, usually community land trusts have a social impact vision, have a, are mission driven, are wanting to maintain the integrity of the property or the neighborhood uh, where they invest. And lastly is the opportunity zone funds. And uh, we're not going to go into that today like I usually do. Like I said, we're breaking that presentation off. But that is a new thing as of 2017. And this is a great way for people to invest in real estate and defer capital gains taxes. So the ideal uh, investor for an opportunity zone fund is someone who has realized the capital gain and, and, and wants to keep their money invested. It doesn't have to be real estate. So a, you could 1031 exchange and defer your capital gains if you sell your investment property. So you would do an opportunity zone only if your exchange failed. If you couldn't find a property in that period of time, now you can roll into an opportunity zone. But let's say you sold your stocks. Let's say you sold your business. Let's say you sold some precious metals. Or let's say you sold some fine art or you sold whatever and you had a capital gain and, that, and you could not do a 1031 exchange. What you could do is roll your money into an opportunity zone fund in which you can defer a large part of your capital gains taxes and still reap the benefits of ownership in real estate. So these are just some of the forms. And I, I, I'm spending a little bit more time on this section than I will the others, because I think this is very, very important. And I hope this has broke down. And if you have some questions, again, make sure you throw them into the chat. So 
Now, next, we're going to talk about why invest into a group. You see the structures. Well, why would you do this at all, right? And I think one of the main reasons why you would do this is that you would be able to purchase more property than you could by yourself. You can buy more than you could individually. Now, I'm speaking to you guys from two, two fronts here, people who want to put this together and then people who want to invest into one, right? Either way, you can buy more property than you could buy yourself. A lot of people could start off buying real estate and they love it and it's going well and then they run out of capital because they are buying money, uh, using their money to buy real estate and at some point you run out. And a great way to keep the train rolling is to go find great deals and then find investors, right? So you can buy more than yourself. There's other people who say, hey, I love this idea of buying into a hotel or I want to, you know, maybe I own some single family houses or small apartments here, but I want to get do something bigger. I just... I'm not there yet for me to be able to do that individually. And I don't necessarily have the time or want to manage the project, but I can put my cash with someone who does have the time to manage it and has the experience to do so. So that would be why you would invest into a group. Now, also, you can limit your liability to only the capital that you invest, eliminating mortgage risk and property operational risk. So yes, you can lose your capital, in real estate, just like every other investment you invest in. That's a part of investing. That's why you have to take the time to understand risk. That's why I'm talking about it right now, right? However, losing your money is only one risk in the real estate business. We got something called mortgage risk, right? If you've ever been through a foreclosure, or lost a property, you know what I'm talking about because when the bank forecloses on a property, not only do you lose your money, but your credit can be damaged. And also in California, this is a judicial state. If you're very wealthy and you're, the bank loses money on their loan, which happened a lot in the Great Recession, that bank technically can come after you. They could sue you for the difference. Now, that's a rare occasion, but I saw it happen a few times. You know what I mean? I've seen that happen. So I'm telling you about that. So the, that's mortgage risk. You can get your credit destroyed. If you cross collateral, meaning that this loan is attached to this property and attached to other properties, you can only lose, you can not only lose the property that you, you lost, but you're going to lose another property. I saw that happen. I saw a guy build a property downtown Oakland. It was an $80 million loan. That, that property ended up selling for $20 million. They said he lost his whole portfolio. That sucks. All right. So a way that you can eliminate that type of risk is investing into a group. Right. Also, not cross collateralizing everything, by the way, not necessarily a good idea. <laughs> there could be a reason for doing that, but that you every deal should stand on its own. Right. But if you just are saying, hey, I'm going to put this capital up. But I don't want to have that kind of mortgage risk. That's another great way of doing it. Now, property operational risk is a risk, but most insurance policies are going to handle that. They're going to take care of that, all right? And don't skimp on insurance. I'm not saying you want to pay the premium of the premium, but you don't want to be a, you don't want to go for the cut rate discount insurance on your investment property because you want, somebody slips and falls, busts their head, something happens at the property, look, they're going to come and sue you. If you got the right insurance though, insurance is going to take care of it. It's not going to be that big of a deal. You can, you know, keep rolling. But a lot of investors especially people coming over from the stock market or other investments, they don't want no parts of that. They just want to put up the capital and have their capital at risk, right? Because that's what they're used to in other, other worlds. Investing in a group is a great way to do that. Because if you just say, hey, I'm going to go buy this 10 unit building by myself. I'm going to put the down payment. I'm going to get the mortgage. I'm going to run the place. You have all those risks. Not a bad thing, right? Just understand that's a benefit for why you would invest into a group. Now, another thing is, a lot of people say, I want to be no landlord. I don't want to be fixing toilets and I don't need all the building tenants and taxes and toilets and all of this stuff. So if you put your money into a group, there's a sponsor that's going to handle that so that you don't have to deal with, we deal with those issues, right? You're just passively invested. Now for your sponsors out there, people want to put the deal together. It's kind of the same thing. I don't want to be out there fixing toilets. I'm coming from the office in a suit, fixing toilets. I ain't trying to do that. Right you should be having property managers in place. You should be having vendors, contractors, 
handyman, people that can come out and do the work for you. And if you're running the show, your, your job is more so as an asset manager than a property manager. Now, if you're a property manager by trade and that's what you do and you have that experience and you can bring that value to the table, which is very valuable, by the way. Now, you can manage the project. You can have people and you can also asset manage. But for a lot of us out here, a lot of you guys that are putting this thing together, you will be the asset manager managing the property manager and managing all of the processes, managing the net operating income, managing the asset. All right. Very important that we point that that's the leverage that's of having a group and a team to help you out. And, and the last point I'm talking about is you leverage the strength of other members of the group. So if you have a group, somebody may be a contractor, somebody may have property management experience, somebody may have just tons of dough. Somebody may have the most excellent credit in the world. So you can get the best possible interest rate you can, right? You can leverage the strengths and member of, of other members of the group when you're in a group. You can limit your liability. You can minimize the management hassle. So those are some of the great reasons why you would do this. Now, keeping it real, there's also cons. Look, at the end of the day, there's going to be pros and cons to everything, right? I was talking to my son and, and a couple of his, his buddies who play ball. I coach football and, you know, my son plays quarterback and he was, we were talking about, we we're watching the Super Bowl. We we're talking about pressure. Right. And my, my, son, my son said, Hey, I love being a quarterback. Only thing about being a quarterback is a lot of pressure when you're at, at that point. I said, you know, Hey, that's, that's a great point. You know, and then we we're watching the Super Bowl and I was saying, who do you think got more pressure on them? The, these two quarterbacks who are in the Super Bowl or the quarterbacks who are sitting at home watching in the Super Bowl right now, at this moment, who got more pressure? Well, obviously, it's the people who are in the game. They got some pressure on them because they're in that game. And I heard actually this morning um, something I was, I was listening to on YouTube. It was Tom Ferry inter interviewing Tim, Tim Grover. Tim Grover was the trainer of Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. He was, their, their, um, he was his personal trainer. What he said was, Pressure is a privilege, right? So the higher you go up, there's pressure, right? Which is a is maybe not the most positive thing to think about. Like when you're a young kid, you want to play ball, you want to get out there looking at the Super Bowl. But those guys, look, in that moment, there's a bunch of pressure right there. But that was a privilege for them to be at that point. And I bring it to this point because there's some cons to group investing. I think the pros weigh out the cons. But nonetheless, the cons exist, and you need to be uh, you need to understand that. All right, understand the first thing is that the investment is illiquid in nature. Right, it ain't liquid. You can't just go and call your stock broker. Hey, I'm, I need to sell these stocks. I need to. I, you can't just go on your app here and say Robinhood. I'm getting ready to sell this Bitcoin. I'm out. You know what I mean? You can call your broker and say, Hey, we, you know, uh, you know, we need to we need to list this property and get it get it sold if you own it outright. And even if you do, say you own the property outright and you say, all right, we need to sell a property. Y'all know how it go. Even in the hottest of markets, you have to prepare the listing. You got to sign a bunch of disclosures. You got to get it on the market. In the hottest of markets, a week to two weeks, maybe a marketing time, you want to market the property, get multiple offers. You know, cash offer might be 30 days if it's, if it's commercial. Maybe it's, you know, two weeks if it's residential. They got to do their inspections. They got to do that. So that's what we call illiquid. It's also similar in, in all real estate. Now, in a group, you can't just come and call up the sponsor that you put your money with. Hey, I, I'm running tight on dough. We need to sell this whole building right now. Nah, it don't work like that. When you invest in a group, there, there's an expectation of how long this is going to occur. Hey, the holding period, right? This typically, it's going to be a little bit more long term. Now. You might be in a flip group and you guys are buying and flipping. But even then, it's illiquid and you got to wait till the property's prepared to sell and then it's got to sell. And it's got to, once it's in escrow, then it's got to close. All right. When you're in a group, it's more complicated because you can't just call that shot. It's a group decision typically when we buy or sell and there has to be a majority. All right. The sponsor, the leader is going to kind of drive that. So you can't just call and say, I need my money out. It, it, it does not work like that. This is a long-term situation, very illiquid in nature, especially when you're in a group. Now, 
say you do need your money back, if something happened and you actually need that money, you can sell your interest. Say you own 20% of the deal, you can sell that 20% of the deal. However, that's complicated. There's not like a ready market for that. Like if you say you want to go sell your stocks or you want to sell the property outright, you say you want to sell the property outright, there's a ready market for that, right? If you say, hey, I want to sell 20% of a property, there's not a ready market for that. It can be done. Usually when this happens, the sponsors will end up buying that, that person's interest if they're capitalized to do that or sell it to another investor in their database. That can be done. They'll do it for a fee, but it ain't like just going and doing it overnight. It's complicated. It's complex. It's going to create some tax situations for you and possibly the group. And it's difficult. Another con is that you may lose complete control of operations. Right? So it's both sides of the fence, by the way. So if you're the passive investor saying, hey, I'm, you know, putting up some money, you are not the managing member. You are not dictating how the management goes at this property and at this asset. You do have a vote, right? You have a say-so in a limited capacity. That's why I say you lose complete, complete control. You have some say-so, so you're an owner, but you don't got complete control. Flip side for the sponsor, you don't got complete control either, right? And a lot of guys, and I know one of my top clients, my, my wealthiest client, he does not partner. He does not group invest. He only does his own deals. He won't even take on institutional equity that acts like debt. It's equity, but it's structured as debt. He don't even want that on his deals because he wants absolute control. And when you put together a group, when you syndicate a property, you lose absolute control, even as the sponsor. However, you can maintain management, control over the, over the property asset, and here's the key, syndicators, if you're a leader, meaning that you're a real leader, not just by position, you have influence. Influence can't be taken away. And I guess, yes, it could, depending, but all things considered, you don't lose that, all right? Other investors have voting rights. They may have ideas on when they want to sell, when they want to refinance, all this stuff, but you can maintain the leadership, the captain of the ship, so, so to speak, by being a great leader and having an influence over people in a positive way. But understand, you don't got full control over the deal. Not no more. Not when you go into a group, all right? Decisions on when to buy, sell, and refinance are group decisions, and dealing with partners can be difficult, all right? Just like dealing with people in business in general can be difficult difficult so i don't want to i want to break these down but i don't want to make it seem like the end of the world because it ain't right these are just some things like to understand and consider it's like what the guy tim grover said pressure is a privilege and these are some of maybe the pressures that come along with the glamour of syndicating properties now you be the judge i think Pros outweigh the cons, uh, by far and away. But I'm always going to break it down to you guys and keep it real from both sides of the fence. Now, let's get a little bit more nitty gritty uh, uh, into what we're talking about. Now, group investing, by the way, essentially is what's called syndications. It's it's a layman term for syndication, and it is I believe in layman terms. By the way, in the investment world of commercial real estate, but also the Wall Street is even worse. But in commercial real estate, there's a lot of terms that are different, let's say, than residential. And people in the industry will purposely speak in those terms because they, they want to either qualify to see if you know what you're talking about, or they just want to sound really, you know, smart and arrogant, right? And that's just, I see that all every day of the week in commercial real estate. Like I said, the stock market guys, Wall Street's even worse, right? What I like to do is take something complex and make it simple, put it in layman terms. I want it, simple use is better, all right? So group investing and syndications are often interchanged. And a syndicate may be defined as a group of people who form an association to undertake a business transaction. Now, there's a book you should read if you're interested in putting this stuff together. It's called It's a Whole New Business by Gene Trowbridge. Gene Trowbridge is a lawyer. It's also a CCIM designation. But he's a lawyer who specializes in syndication. He's wrote an amazing book. I've actually, if you hit my YouTube 
uh, channel up. I have a couple of interviews with Gene on there, and he is a, he, you know, he's a one of a kind type of guy. So check him out. So just to you know conceptualize this, say you want to go out and buy a twenty unit apartment, but it costs two, two million. That ain't here. That might be in in Texas somewhere, but I ain't here in the Bay Area. But let's just say twenty units, two million. But you don't have two million or, or the resources even to, to to make that happen by yourself. So you go and form a syndicate. What you could do is go find 10 investors who put up 200 grand and now you can buy the place all cash. That would be a syndicate. You could also find 10 investors with 100 grand all cash or 100 grand, that would be a million and you guys go out and get a loan for the balance. That also would be a syndicate. And you can you know, play around with those numbers however you want it to go, all right? This is just an example of how everything that we're talking about can come together in a structure of a deal. Not that rocket science all right keep it that's very very important it's not rocket science it's as simple as you know putting 10 together investors together you guys you put up all the cash and, and go all cash which by the way if you're in a real estate business you've probably been outbid by somebody coming in all cash yes i know it ain't just me right those typically are our groups now maybe one person individually right there's a lot of people with cash individually but let me just tell you there's a lot of groups out there with a lot of cash. And what they typically do is come in all cash, get the great price or, or just get the property. Then typically we'll come and refinance down the line. By the way, you're also competing with big hedge funds, which essentially are, are, are groups, They're syndications, right? They're funds though. So they got more money, more power. And it's it, funds like BlackRock and Blackstone I've been buying single family homes at the auction steps since the great recession popped off and they're still they're still doing they're now that they're, now they're buying homes off the market. Crazy homes, crazy prices, but they're buying them because they can, you know, buy at all cash and even if it's 3% they're generating a yield. Right? So understand what a group is, understand we talked about the structure, we talked a little bit about the breakdown, the pros and cons and understand the power of what's going on. So when you look up and say, oh, that's why these people, I'm, there was a hundred offers on this property. They went to this, this one LLC over here is end up being a buyer, probably a group, all right? So we talked about the pros and cons. If you're out here struggling by yourself, consider putting a group together or being a part of a group because you can do more than you can as a team than you could individually. And that's who's winning out here. These groups are out here, they're out here making it happen, all right? Now, all of that brings us to where the rubber meets the road. It's called raising money. When you put together a group, you have to raise the money to make it happen, right? When you are an investor and you wanna invest in a group, you gotta connect with someone who's raising the money. And again, it's not so much of an exact science, like you can just go to Robin Hood and find a stock. It's, you don't work like that. You know what I mean? You really got to have the right connections in this business. Now, there are online ways, and I'll talk about that, to, to raise money and mass market. But for the majority of how these deals get structured, it happens through relationships. However, the rules of raising money have changed with the Jobs Act of 2012, creating avenues to advertise investment opportunities for small businesses and startups. However, best way to raise money is still in developing relationships. And over the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about methods of finding money for deals. Now, flip side of this, guys, if you are an investor and you are looking for groups to work with, a lot of these same methods are gonna work for you to associate with the group because finding the right group is important, it's critical very critical you don't want to just be doing this by yourself and you know so don't, don't just want to be shooting from the hip in terms of where you're going to find your group to invest and if you're the sponsor you have to have a tactical method of approach for finding investors and raising money very important now i'm going to talk about some of the ways that i've i, I learned about and some of the things that i've done that helped us be successful raising some capital for deals first of all and I think first and foremost, which is why I'm bringing the seminar back eventually, we're planning for next month, is networking, 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 networking. Number one way, 
and you network at real estate seminars, trade shows, events, and mixers. Essentially, you want to network where people will be who will value what you have to offer. So if you're, if you're you know, buying an apartment building or say you're buying an office building, you want to be where people who understand that are, right? You don't necessarily want to go to the single family world conference and all they're talking about is single family homes and you got apartments or you got, you know, shopping center. That's a big shock and all. Somebody might be able to sell their single family home and roll into that, but usually different strokes for different folks. So you want to try to network with people who are aligned with what you're doing, but network nonetheless. Now, you all know it's got a lot more difficult to do that in the pandemic, right? Because most of our meetings are this in Zoom world, right? And I know y'all, if you like me, we ready to get out of the Zoom world and go meet because the magic happens when you're at an event and you're, you're shaking hands, passing out business cards, you're connecting with people. That I cannot tell you how many deals, either deals that we did or broker deals, just deals that happen from directly from networking at events. I mentioned the CCIM uh, designation that I have. Every class I took at us at the CCIM Institute, I ended up doing business with somebody from that class. I took, I think, five different four core classes, an, actually an elective class, and then the, the final exam. I mean, every single one of them, I, I did some business with people that I took the class with. And that was kind of the big the big uh, uh, driver for you spending the money coming getting this this education so you can go network now it's different now but you can still network you could even network on this forum now through the chat introducing yourself you know saying some stuff but you got to make sure you network now a key thing about networking just a little advice here because i've been doing this my whole life all my whole business life networking events and, and when you're networking that's not time for you to present that is not time for you to go into the deep dive pitch about what you're offering, about what yourself, about who you are, all right? What you wanna do is you wanna meet and engage people, ask them engaging questions about what they're doing here, what, what kind of business they're involved in, what their interests are, you know, what their, once you start a conversation, what their outlook is in the market, what they think about apartments, whatever. You wanna get them talking and if they and you want them to talk because they're going to talk and then when they talk they actually start building rapport with you because they're like okay this is a person that's actually this is an interesting person even though they're the ones talking they look at you and figure that you're interesting because you're allowing them to talk because most people don't do that they just and nobody wants to talk to somebody who over talks them at the end of the day right so you want to ask engaging questions and when then they ask you about what you're doing you want to be succinct about it 30 seconds to a minute hey this is what i'm doing we're buying properties we're putting together groups to buy properties not would you be interested in it oh we're putting together uh, groups to buy properties that are generating eight to ten percent cash on cash return i'm pretty excited about it i'm learning more that's that's why i'm out kind of here to meet and network with people you know what what are you what are you doing what are you here to learn or network about type of thing and then that what you want to do is get someone's information business card or connect with them on linkedin uh, or whatever social media medium connect with them and then follow up when you follow up you book a meeting now you can go into what you're talking about the very big mistake i see a lot of people do at networking events they come with a bunch of flyers and they're talking about what they're doing that's the easiest way to turn people off in a networking event. You got to be smooth with it. People are there to network, but they're not there to hear a commercial, right? And especially experienced, savvy people, which if you're raising money, that's what you're looking for. They, they, they were there to meet people, but they're not there to hear a commercial. So be smooth about your approach. Understand how to ask engaging questions and make sure you get their information. You getting their business card is more important than you giving them your business card you want to be professional so you have your business card they even have electronic business cards they got things you know you, you can qr code somebody on linkedin or whatever but get their info that's the principle all right now you want to approach pre-existing business acquaintances past clients uh if you're in business already those can be great sources asking for referrals from clients attorneys accountants 
wealth managers and financial planners. Now, here's a note on this. I've done a few deals through wealth managers. Typically, these are folks that are securities licensed, right? But all of their, look, a bunch of, all the rich folks own real estate. You know, it may not be the core of what they do, right? So with these wealth managers, most of their clients' core business or core investment is going to be with them. It's going to be some sort of equity. It's going to be stocks, bonds, whatever. You know what I mean? Um, annuities, insurance. But they all either have some real estate or want to buy some real estate, especially if you have all that stuff. A lot of these guys want to own investment property just to have the depreciation write off. So a lot of people ask me, well, why do people buy these three and 4% cap rates? It doesn't make any sense. There's a, and there's actually a lot of reasons why as to why somebody would buy a three or four cap rate, all right? First of all, those are typically great neighborhoods that are gonna have growth over, over the long term. But also at that, at that price point, they're probably getting a nice, healthy depreciation write-off. And if you're making a bunch of money from your business or from your stocks, that can be a great way to invest. And in fact, those are great prospects for you guys putting together deals because they're looking, they're not so, oh, we need to squeeze every penny out of the deal. They're like, hey, we got this deal and maybe, maybe, maybe the property only yielded 4%, but we got this depreciation write off that was bigger than what we earned. So we actually got a net loss when I got my K1. K1 is the document you get every year from the investment. So I now can take that loss and we'll go get a tax benefit. All right. That's why having wealth managers and financial planners and accountants as part of your network group is critical. All right. Now, last thing I'm going to talk about is you can engage crowdfunding sites to market your offering. As a result of the Jobs Act, um, that opens up marketing investments to people um, that are not Charles Schwab and Merrill Lynch. Now, you got to follow the rules. You got to have a specific offering and you go into a crowdfunding site. Now that that mass market your product out to the world, you can do it. Costs a lot of money to set that up, but that can be done. All right, and there, these are just some ways of raising. Oh, one thing: invest. I, I missed this. In current property owners, people who own property now, but maybe they're looking at retirement, or maybe they're looking at, hey, I'm going to sell this property. And I need something to where I can kick my feet up. I've been doing this 40 years. It's time to, it's time to, I want to have passive income. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want to be driving the deal anymore. Though these are actually often great candidates to go into a group. Now, we talked about the ways of raising money. Now we're going to talk about the actual prospects. Okay. And in, in talking about these ways, it leads to specifically to the prospects, but they're, they're, they're two different things. So when you're going through a net to a network in a, a meeting, let's say you're looking to network with these type of individuals or network with someone like a wealth manager or a financial planner who handles these type of individuals business. All right. I wanted to point that out because it is two different things. You, you, you know, in order to meet these people, you have to have a method in which to meet them. And that's what we just talked about. All right, so who are some of the great prospects? Now, individuals who have what's called self-directed IRAs. Self-directed IRA, individual retirement account, is someone who has now taken the steps, paid the money to set up their own account, move some of the money from you know their traditional IRA or traditional 401k, or just set it up themselves to where they themselves, the person, can direct, that's why it's called self-directed, where their investment goes. So these are people who are a little bit more sophisticated and saying, hey, look, I think I can beat what Charles Schwab is doing out there. I think I can beat what, you know, a Fisher Investments and them is doing out there. Let me self-direct. Plus, I want to invest in real estate. I want to, you know, I want to diversify or I just want control over what I'm doing. Now, the reason why these are ideal investment in general prospects is because they have to keep the funds invested. These are real investors. They are investing for the long term. So whatever they make out of this, they got to put back into the IRA. And then and then at one point when they ride off into the sunset, they can get the funds out of the IRA and all of that. Anything they take out now, they're going to get penalized for. So they are wanting to reinvest. So they, they, they don't mind necessarily the illiquidity of the group investment. 
That's why, because they but they can't touch it. Money has to stay invested. Somebody who puts up a hundred grand and then, you know, their business is hurting. They may, or, you know, they're going through divorce and they say, Hey, I, I need that cash. It's not as disciplined as someone who's got these self-directed eyes. Their sole purpose for having that money is for building growth to when they get 65 or 70, whenever, whenever their mountaintop is, right? Great, great category of people to be talking to. Now, the next great category is people who are conducting 1031 exchanges and looking to maybe not be the driver of the deals anymore. They're just looking for passive income. When someone sells a property and does a 1031 exchange, they have to reinvest in a period of time and, and following a, a set of rules in order to defer their capital gains, right? And if they've owned this property for a while, they probably got tremendous amounts of capital, capital gains and they need to reinvest, but they don't want to own and operate. So investing with you and your group could be a great way to go. So you want to look for people like that. All right. When back in the day, when I was doing this, I would be, I would call agents and say, Hey, I see you're selling this property. It says you're doing a 1031 exchange. If you found your replacement property yet, Hey, we've got some stuff. We'll talk about it. Now um, that's a way real estate agents don't want to get paid. Uh, they want to sell their property and, and find another one, but sometimes they can't. And a group investment can be a, a great way of doing that. All right, so you want to find people who are in 1031 exchanges. Now, also, this is where I talked about wealth managers, financial planners, CPAs. Typically, these people doing exchanges, they're going to be talking to their CPA, right? If they're not talking to their CPA and they're doing exchange, they're not smart. Most investors at this level got some understanding. They're talking to their accountant. They're talking to their financial planner. That's why you need to have some of these people in your network, right? Because now they may say, hey, look, you need to talk to uh, this person over here because they're doing a group and I think this would, would work out good for you. Now, people like that, let me just say this word of caution. And they're very, very particular with who they refer. They're not going to refer you out if it's fly by night because their reputation's on the line. You wouldn't, you listening to this, you're going to only refer people to other people who you have a comfort level with the person you refer. Keep that with a grain of salt. All right. But people doing 1031 exchanges looking for passive income, ideal prospects for group investing. Also, busy professionals who got the money, but they don't necessarily have the time or expertise to operate investment real estate. A lot of these tech folks, right, in the Bay Area making a ton of money in tech. But if you're working in tech, you know, that's an intense world. You know, that's 60, 80 hours a week type of world. And you got to be, it's very competitive. So you don't necessarily have the time to be out there hunting down deals and dealing with, you know, operating the property manager at the property, operating the building. So those are great prospects for people that can invest in your group. Now, also ambitious investors seeking to invest in projects larger than what they can buy on their own. I got a couple of people like that I'm working with now that said, hey, we got a bunch of smaller buildings. Steve, we're, 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 let's do something bigger together. Let's, let's go find some deals because they're wanting to do more than they can do themselves. Right. There are people like I told you about my main, my, my top most wealthiest client. He only does his own deals. Right. He's at that level and he's been at that level for a while. Right. So he can just go do it. He can never do a deal again in his life and he's going to be cool. So therefore, he only does things his way. But there are other people who are saying, hey, look, I'm going to grow and I want to expand. I'm going to do it with some other people. I know I can do more with others than I could do by myself. Right. And the last group is people who have experienced the capital gain. Now, I already talked about 1031 exchanges, but what I'm talking about here is somebody sold their business. We're talking about tech. A bunch of, a bit, a bunch of the tech world, especially the startup world guys, are building their businesses solely so they can be acquired. They're building the business for the big payday at the end or to maybe take it public. Either way it goes, those folk are going to have a capital gain event. And they're not able to simply 1031 exchange their, their stocks. What they could do, though, is they can invest that into you if you have an opportunity zone fund, which is a great structure. And that's another presentation. But they can invest that with you, earn yield and defer capital gains. So this is the who behind the what of the what of the methods I explained. These are the people that you want to be searching for while you're out there conducting the methods of finding people to raise this capital. Now, I've told you, if you are the individual investor, the flip side is for you as well. All the methods of which I, I said of how you would find investors, you as the investor, these are methods of which you would find the deal and the sponsors, all right? Same thing, cuts both ways. Very important, all right? 
And as we wrap, and I'm right, I'm a little bit long as we wrap, we're doing this right now. I'm working with uh, Paul Chambers of Chambers Construction. We acquired two lots in Oakland, in Oakland's Opportunity Zone, for, uh, in our Oakland's Opportunity Zone, and we're developing these sites. And we're doing this via a fund. Very exciting. If you're looking to learn more information about that, set an appointment with me after, after this. We can sit down and tell you all of what we're doing. But we are live and we are doing this now. If you, if you know, if you're from Oakland, uh, Soul Beat was like Oakland's uh, version of BET. It was a locally owned, uh, black owned uh, cable station in Oakland that, that really was a great fixture in our city uh, for businesses that a lot of small businesses advertise on, on Soul Beat. A lot of artists, whether recording music artists, comedians got their start on Soul Beat. It was great. That building, uh, they, they vacated the building, I think late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, someone had it, lost in foreclosure. A guy who bought it from foreclosure, he was using it to store cars. He got code violations. We bought the building next door and then bought the building from him. And now, so this is going to be a development. Um, very excited about bringing some e economic viability to East Oakland into a site that's been dormant for about 20 years. So excited about that. Now, I, I tell I want to show you some real what's going on. So I don't want to just talk theories to y'all. This is something that we're doing, but check it out. What you going to do? This whole thing, like I said in the beginning, is about taking action steps. Right? How many of you guys have been to a million seminars, learned some stuff, but didn't put that in, in place? I'm guilty of that, right? What I learned was, if I just take action steps on one thing that I learned, if I just take action steps on one idea, the stuff, the time I take to learn something now generates a return. What I also learned, if I don't take action on that, it ain't going to generate no return. And in fact, not only is it not going to generate a return, it's going to develop frustration. So here's just some ideas of a few action steps that you can take. Decide if group investing is something that you would like to participate in or something that you would like, like to arrange yourself. Right? Either way it goes, it's a business that you're investing in or it's a business that you're running. Okay? Not just passive stocks out there in the world. It's a business. That's why I like it. It's the benefit of it. All right, link up with people you like and you trust. Life is too short to work with people. There might even be some trustworthy people you know that are pain in the ass to talk to. Let me just tell you, if you have to deal with these people in a five, five, three to five to seven year holding period, it could be like pulling teeth. They might be trustworthy, but just talking to them is, is laborious. Don't do it. Don't do it. Like, like, you know, life is short. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, do business with people you like and trust. Decide what type of properties that you want to go after and put in place your investment criteria. We talked about this at the beginning. Very important. Then consider working with a group or starting your own. You know, we've got a group. If you want to consider working with, if you want to start your own group, if you want, now this is not on there. If you want to start your own group, get a really good attorney. Now, some of these attorneys are $500 an hour, $1,000 an hour. You could probably find a good syndications attorney, a good attorney to put together an offering for you between $250 and $500 an hour. There are people that are more than that, right? But you could probably get between $250 and $500 an hour, find somebody out there. And if you're an investor who's putting things in, putting money into it, it's still good an idea to have an, have an attorney reviewing things. You know, uh, everybody's got their own opinion about attorneys, so I'll leave that alone. But I'm telling you, especially if you're putting it together, you need to have a good attorney to, to make this thing happen. Do not do this thing on your own. And then just don't do nothing. Take some action for your family, for your community, for your portfolio. We need more action-oriented people out there, right? Whatever's happening now in this pandemic in the future, we need action-oriented people taking action, making things happen, all right? And lastly, you need to subscribe to our YouTube station. If you haven't subscribed, Go ahead and do it right now and share it with friends because what we do is we consistently put out content weekly and monthly for the real estate investor, developer, brokers, and agent in the space of commercial and investment real estate. And we're not just, you know, selling, we're not selling programs and we're not selling mentorship and we're not selling boot camps. And I'm not really against any of those things. We are selling real estate. 
right? And the way we in which we sell real estate, commercial investment real estate, is we provide content to our clientele, and who then racks around and does business with us. And we've been doing this since 2011, and it's worked out well. Tap in with us. All of our webinars are, are replayed on our YouTube station, but we have weekly content in between our webinars. So make sure you tap in. Now, that being said, we do have some questions. We're a little bit long here, but let's go to the Q&A and then I'll go to the chat. Sarita Turner says, can you put the name of the book and the, offer, off, and the author in the chat? My connection is not the best. Yes, I will. So the book that I referenced is called It's a Whole New Business by Gene Trowbridge. I'm going to put that in. I'm typing it in. It's a Whole New Business. by Gene Trowbridge. And there is an update to that book that was done due to um, the 2017 uh, Opportunity Zones and uh, uh, Tax Cuts Act. So there was an update that was done to that book, but you can find that book on Amazon. It's, 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 a, it's a book, it's a, like a textbook. You know what I mean? That's a, it's a serious read, all right? It's a serious read. But if you're going to do it, I, you know, hop off and get off into there. Ginger Latu says, do you recommend using two different LLCs for each party involved or just one LLC where each party owns a certain percentage? Great question. Yes, there should be. Well, here. Yes and no is the answer. Well, first of all, here it goes. There should be one entity that then owns the property outright. Right. That entity, XYZ LLC, owns the property, let's say, right? XYZ LLC owns the building at, here's our office, 250 MacArthur Boulevard in, in uh, San Leandro, let's just say. Now, each individual investor can and should own their interest in an entity, whether that's an LLC, whether that's a trust, whatever it is. The individual partners should also be entities and not themselves. That's good asset, you know, protection and asset planning, you know, asset preservation planning. All right, is to have the LLC that then runs the property, and then to have the the owners be LLCs, and also you can have it to where say you're putting the, together the company. You have the company, let's say this is 250 MacArthur where we are, 250 MacArthur Boulevard LLC owns the building. And let's say you are the managing member. It does make sense in, in many instances for now your interest to be another LLC. So you can have your own asset management LLC. Uh, 123 Asset Management LLC owns 30% of the deal of 250 MacArthur LLC. And then the partners own the rest in their respective interests. Doing it that way really makes, you know, you're paying some extra LLC fees and all that kind of stuff, but it really separates, you know, and, and gives you extra layers of protection. And then it's a great way, okay, you may be having multiple properties of you managing multiple properties and doing things is a great way to build up corporate credit. It's a great way to kind of build up an operating history, a balance sheet, uh, all of those things. Now, it all kind of depends, though, on, on the game plan. That's why I was saying up front, what is the game plan? What is your investment plan? What is your investment criteria? What are you going to do? If you're 1031 exchanging in and out, you need to have a deeded interest. And so that you very well may need to have two different in entities for sure um, with the deeded interest. And so that if you're not 1031 exchanging in or out, then that's different. All right. So it's uh, so a great question. And I would say, yes, uh, have different LLCs, the one that owns it, and then each owners have their own LLC. That's a good way to do it. It doesn't have to be done that way, though. Depends on how big the deal is, how many partners, what your game plan is going for. Are you doing this as a one off deal? Or are you doing this as a business? All right. So hope that answers that, Ginger. Sarita says, does the person whose credit is used assume the risk of the mortgage? Yes, they do. Now, anybody typically in commercial real estate mortgages, and I think the same is the true for residential investment property mortgages, anybody who is 20% or more. So if somebody is 20% partner or more, 
the bank wants to underwrite them, all right? And so keep that with a grain of salt. If somebody has horrible credit, they may need to be 19% or less. Just saying, all right? But yes, whoever's on the hook for the mortgage, the person whose credit is used, and if it's multiple people, they are on the hook for the mortgage, all right? And mo most loans have what's called a personal guarantor requirement, meaning you have to sign personally. If they foreclose, meaning they can sue you because it's a judicial state. Very highly unlikely that they would sue you and go after you, but they could, and they require you to sign a personal guarantee, right? So that is part of the mortgage risk that we talk about when you're putting these deals together. And so I hope that answers that. Yes, uh, and yes, I put the um, I put the author and the book in the chat. Valencia says, I'm interested in learning more about your group. What's up, Valencia? How are you doing? It's good to see you again or virtually see you. Go ahead and text me or message me, or I would say even one better, book an appointment. And the best way to book an appointment with me, actually, is to go to watch one of our videos. On all of our videos, in the description, we have a Calendly link. And go on that Calendly link and book a time, because I don't even... Yeah, I, I don't know my schedule until I talk to my assistant and and the assistant team and they tell me what the schedule is because it people book appointments on there all the time and we have to have meetings and daily checkups on our schedule. That what that therefore the best way to go on there is to hit up on our videos, go to the description, book a time where we can talk 30 minutes and we can talk shop. And Valencia, I would love to talk to you about what we're doing. Okay, Valencia says we'll do. And I think, let me see if I'm, I think that is all the questions that we got. So I really, I know we went what, we went about nine minutes over. I'm sorry about that. I wanted to make sure we, we had this time to talk and we, we went over this information. And there's a few things in there I'm trying to brush over, but I really wanted to go in depth and in detail. So I really do hope that helps. Okay, looks like one real quick, Another question just popped in. Sarita says, I've heard S-Corps are the best structure for real estate partnerships. I think if you're talking partnerships, I think an LP, limited partnerships, better than an S-Corp. Um, S-Corps, I've, I've owned real estate in, in, in an S-Corp before. I, it's a little clunky. I, an LLC or LP, in my experience, is, is better. Now, there is some tax benefits and liabilities where I would say talk to a tax person. But I think the way we had it in the S Corp was a little bit less to a tax advantage versus having an LLC. Uh, but at the end of the day, S Corps and LLC are very, very um, similar. You're not getting double taxed like you would in a C Corp as you would with an S Corp. But I, the reason I did my S Corp was that I had my um, business purpose property in the S Corp. The S Corp was my holding company. And I didn't have, um, you know, it wasn't, it was an, it just that was for our business purpose property. It was different. Like it wasn't an investment property that we owned for the, for the investment you. It was a property we owned for the purpose of running the business. So it was a little different. Um, I probably use an LLC on the next time I do that um, versus the S Corp. There's, there's some benefits for an S Corp. And I think that's where everybody's situation, by the way, is a little bit different. That's why you need to sit down and talk. It's not like a template one size fit all type of thing. You definitely need to uh, make sure as you are talking to a really good CPA, a really good uh, a person that knows you and knows what you're doing. So with that being said, guys, we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, I, I really appreciate your time. Sorry I went over a little bit. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope this was helpful. Reach out to us. Our phone number is here. It went out of the the slideshow, but our phone number 510-675-7755. Our office picks up that number. Uh, I would say our website, infinityinvestments.net, but the best way, hit up our YouTube station, book an appointment. Let's stay tapped in. I'm wishing you the best of success in your investing career. And 
consider investing in a group, consider starting a group, just do something.